facilities, the various programs uh, that we're putting in place. Uh, we explained our local manifesto. Uh, we also had quite a few discussions about uh, the work in the community, how people are coming together and helping each other out. There were quite a lot of comments on our Facebook page, which we didn't get a chance to answer. We, we did say that we would try to come back and answer some of those questions today, um, as well as take more questions. So if you're, if you're watching this live, please ask your questions in the comments and we'll try our best to answer them. Uh, and then perhaps we can have a discussion about the things that matter to you. The campaign is nearing the end. We are reaching the end of the electoral period. Uh, we're going into the last day of the campaign tomorrow, the day after that is cooling off day, and then polling day this Friday. Uh, every campaign is slightly different, uh, and this one has its own unique characteristics as a result of COVID-19. So I thought maybe this evening what I would begin with is to ask my three new comrades, and, and you've met them. We have uh, Desmond Tan, uh, we have uh, Charles Taha, and we have Yo Wan. And I thought I'd ask them how, how they felt, what have they picked up on this journey over the last few days that, that we have gone through together. I'm going to start with Desmond. I mean, you know, Desmond, uh, I, I, are you tired? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Just look at my eye rim, right? <laughs> uh, so I think I, I have also lost a few kg, my wife told me. I didn't so. think it was possible. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, it's really been an eye opener, I must say. It's been quite an intense week, but it's also, I've learned so much things. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you, you sort of jokingly said you're tired, but yeah. it, you know, did you expect it to be this physically fatiguing? Uh, I well, I prepared myself for it mentally, but I, you know, like like most things, right? You you just have to go through it until you go through the journey. You wake up five o'clock, and then you get yourselves ready, and you don't get home until maybe about eleven o'clock. So I think it's it's an intense and re repeated cycle that actually uh, you feel the. The experience, true experience of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, what about you, Sharon? How, what, what's your emotional journey been like over the last few days? How so, you I'll begin with. Unfortunately for me, uh, I didn't get to lose a few uh, kilos. <laughs> I wanted to, to do so. I was hoping to do so. Uh, wasn't able to achieve it. But it's uh, definitely been uh, uh, an adrenaline rush, uh, seeing all our residents in Pathways Pungo. Uh, hearing the stories, uh, having a conversation with you, uh, and uh, definitely I feel energized when I have interactions with uh, the residents. Uh, and you, you you don't realize it throughout the day, but at the end of the day, when you're knocking off at 12 a.m., you are absolutely uh, tired. Uh, and the moment you put your your head to the pillow, and that's it. Mm -hmm. The next thing you know, it's already 5 a.m., and we're up again. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, 5.45 start, uh, yeah. yeah. even though you're staying so close. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I, I get an additional 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Are, are you like going up home for a nap in the middle of the day? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately not. That, that was the plan, but it, uh, and there was no opportunity at all to do that. Yeah. But you've, been, you've, you've sort of had a sense of uh, uh, engagement with the residents as you've gone through. People have Come to know you. Yeah, I was walking around with you today, and then people said, "Yeah, I saw him the other day." You know, you, 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 people have met you several times. Yeah, exactly, and uh, it, it's definitely very uh, exciting when uh, they also we remember each other, and then we have a conversation, and picked up from where we left off. Uh, quite often, we don't have enough time to, to finish conversation or to, to to build on it a bit more. But uh, to bump into each other again and have that conversation and picked up from where we left off is definitely yeah, exciting. It's nice to hear from the residents of Pasir Ris Pongo. Excellent, excellent. No, I, and, and I think uh, one thing: what's your <coughs> experience been like? You've you've uh, uh, been actually very active in the community before in Pongo, before we started this electoral mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. But but that must have been completely different, right? I mean, you had a sense of what was happening, the programs, the jobs, uh, assistance, and so forth. But then we went into the into the campaign. Uh, did you expect it to be like this? And, and how did you find it? Well, um, I'm very energetic, so it's, it's, it's not been too bad for me, but you know, Sharia, right? By the time I get home at night, when I look through my emails, have conversations with the residents online and all that, I actually found there was uh, several times where the phone, I fell asleep with the phone on my forehead. <laughs> 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 but having said this, this has been a very energizing uh, journey for me. 
it's always very nice to meet up with the residents. And Dr. Janelle, you're right. Uh, prior to this, I've been meeting up with a lot of residents on Zoom. And it is really a special treat to be able to see them in real life and to have, you know, chats with them in real life as well. So that was nice for me. Yeah. yeah. Can, I, can I just add that actually my interaction with the residents is not just the walkabout and the face-to-face -face house visits, but also in the social media. We also okay. get quite a number of feedback, questions, and encouragements over the social media, which we also need to dedicate some time to, to listen to them as well. So that's also something that I've learned over the last few few days. Excellent. Just speaking about social media, we are getting a few a few uh, comments and a few uh, questions on, uh, on, our, on our feed. So maybe this is a lot of inappropriate time uh, to bring up a few of those. I'm going to just highlight one to begin with, which is uh, by Eng Ming Jie, who hopes that Madam Sun will be back with us soon. Uh, you know, we, we, she was our colleague for yeah. the last term, and uh, we worked very closely together. So uh, we've repeatedly said we're going to continue working yes. together with her. And I mean, that's so. So we, we value her comradeship, and we'll find ways to to make yes. that work. Well, indeed, I was just uh, with her before coming here for for this uh, live chat today. I was out with her in Pongal West, uh, reassuring the residents of Pongal West that uh, even though Pongal West uh, and this room are in a single member constituency. If she's elected and we are elected, we intend to form a town council together and work together very, very closely. The town council will manage for both towns in an integrated manner, but particularly for Pongo Town, in an integrated manner to maintain the town, make sure that the finances are well managed, make sure the town is well maintained, and also to develop Pongo in an integrated and comprehensive way. So we, we intend to, so yes. Ming Jie, we intend to function as one team if yes. both Pongal West uh, uh, under Misun and the Pasiris Pongal with this team gets elected together uh, as, as a PAP yes. slate. Uh, so so let, let me reassure you on that. Um, there's a very specific question here from uh, Siang Sing about are there plans to build a sheltered walkway and bus stop at Pasiris Grove? Uh, so first point we need to identify who is the MP responsible for pursuing this matter. Pasiris Grove is going to be Depending on which block, I suppose. Well, I have been responsible. <laughs> the MP, we are so not yet. <laughs> there is, there is a plan to do so. Not Passage Grove is where we have quite a number of our new uh, condominium developments. So we do have a plan. In fact, it's going to be executed to build a walkway along the main road, uh, but it will not go into every condominium. So there is a plan, and it's it's, it's in progress. Excellent. A uh, couple more questions. Um, I've got one by Autumn Flowers, uh, Miss Flowers. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm hoping it's a miss, I'm not making, misrepresenting you, but if you are having some issues with your housing, uh, you haven't uh, identified where in our GRC you are, but please contact us directly mm -hmm. and we'll find a way to help you. We don't know when we'll be, if we are elected, we don't know if and how and when we'll be doing Meet the People sessions, but we'll find ways to make ourselves available and accessible mm -hmm. to our residents and help such as what you've described is something that we will find a way to deliver. So please contact us if we are elected uh, and we'll find a way to, to follow up on that. Um, there's, a, there's another question by Yanni Ping and it's asking that uh, there are many exciting developments in place for the Pongo community, whether we have extra plans to balance and protect the biodiversity, the ecosystem and the environment in the midst of our various development works. Uh, and, I, and I think this is a particularly interesting question uh, for us in Pongo particularly where there is a focus on um, preserving the greenery, the biodiversity, and actually we've created new ecosystems uh, through our waterway park. The waterway park is not an ecosystem that was there before and it was very deliberately created um, through a plan from uh, Mr. Mabatan and the Ministry of National right. Development um, that um, has now resulted in actually an increasing amount of biodiversity in the middle of uh, on top of that, the HDB developments have, uh, try very hard to preserve greenery and add greenery. Uh, and again, that creates a substrate for animals and birds and so forth to come in. So um, that is very much part of the overall design of what we do in uh, At the same time, we do have to make sure that we build facilities and homes. So there will be a period of time of construction, but the end result, we hope, is a very green, livable town with lots of uh, water, waterways. If you're not sure what this looks like, 
if you just look at the picture that I posted on my Instagram page last night, which is at the slightly more mature end of uh, the Pongo Waterway Park uh, between Waterway Terrace 1 and 2, you can see uh, BTO developments surrounded by greenery. That's what we hope most of Pongo will eventually look like. Okay, I'm going to move on a little bit. Uh, we hope you can keep your questions and comments uh, coming. But I'm going to ask a question to SMTO. He's been through many more elections <laughs> than all the rest of us put, put, uh, put together. <laughs> New candidates, it's their first election, my third time, but he, he has he has he's done this before. So but SM, it's a, it's actually we say this in a very lighthearted way, but this is a sober election and there are some serious issues out there. How how have you found the campaign this time around? Well, you know, we went China said one of the things that we had to do during this campaign was when we described ourselves. I had to, because we're all wearing masks, so I had to describe myself as, I'm the guy with the white hair, because that's all they could see on <laughs> my face. And I have to say uh, to Daniel, sorry Daniel, <laughs> but he's the one with the, less hair. The so that's how we identified <laughs> ourselves. But indeed, I would say that I've, I've been able to mentor several new candidates uh, through, through the time, seven elections now, seven twenty, And this has been the most unusual election. I think I'll Good candidates may feel it or understand it, but you know, we had just come out of two months of circuit breaker, people were just coming out of their homes, and but it provided an interesting opportunity because during this period, we managed to meet many more residents mm. in a compressed period than we usually do in a general election because people are not traveling overseas for work, for vacation, mm. many people are working from home. And even when they go out for marketing and shopping, they're doing their marketing and shopping close to home. Mm -hmm. So when we did our house visits, there were many more people at home. Mm -hmm. When we went to the markets and the shops and the food courts, there were many more residents, our own residents that we were able to do. So this was quite an unusual circumstance. Mm -hmm. So in every election, uh, our candidate, it's a, it's a very compressed way for our candidates, especially our new candidates, to meet many of our residents. But of course, uh, this is something which uh, has to continue throughout the term. You have to go out, reach out to them on a regular basis, meet them, get to know many, many more of them, and to continue the conversations that Charlie was talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I said the, the COVID-19 situation changed the, the, the tone and the feel of uh, our campaign. It changed what we could do and how the residents could access the information. It's also changed quite a lot of our our, our campaigning strategies, including, for example, doing this, yes. which we hadn't done before last Friday. Uh, but it's also changed the sort of defining issues that we've had to put front and center uh, for our residents. Um, I thought it might be useful then to kind of ask our new candidates, uh, our, our new comrades, they have, if I, I mean, I, I do remember going through my first electoral campaign, and I remember being a feeling like a very different person mm -hmm. uh, at the end compared to the start. And a big part of that was having to grapple with the issues that the campaign threw up, uh, that my interactions with the residents threw up. And I'm assuming my, my three friends have gone through a very similar journey mm -hmm. of personal development and, and, and insight into the issues of the campaign and what our residents face. So I might begin with Desmond. Um, and ask, you know, what have you um, understood about the challenges that our residents are facing and how might that inform what you are going to do should you be elected or should we be elected as a team and we have to get things done. Uh, we, we need to choose what we focus on. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what have you found in the last seven, eight days of yeah. the campaigning that's going to inform that focus that you have? Okay. So the first thing I want to say is that I want to reaffirm the point that you made in our last session that, uh, you know, as representative of the people, it's important to make ourselves accessible, available for our people. So the last seven or eight days that we've been going about, or even before that, actually is an opportunity for us to not just know our residents, but also to hear the stories and get the feedback. Mm -hmm. So that's the first point I want to say that it's, it's an important lesson that I've learned that uh, as, as a representative, we have to get out, put ourselves out there, right? Um, so, of course, we have had many stories. We have had many feedback from residents who, and really thank you for giving us all the feedback uh, over the last many days for myself. 
Uh, and one of the common theme that I personally experienced is actually about uh, issues relating to COVID. That, you know, although we are now going through it together, actually there are a lot of scenarios, a lot of permutations of issues that, you know, our residents are facing relating to COVID. And in particular is the fact that they may, they may not fully know how to seek help, where to get help. You know, you know, throughout this period, we have rolled out, government has rolled out many, many help uh, schemes, financial, or even many other uh, agencies as well, other schemes. But actually, sometimes it's really the last mile, right? Whether people know where to seek help. So I, I was, was there one particular uh, yes. example of this? Yes, I would like to share a story that actually I met a lady who was coming to me and said that actually she would like, she's been trying to get her husband's motorbike back from Malaysia. Because husband, the, hus so the husband's the husband is in Malaysia, the husband was in Malaysia. Husband was in Malaysia in January. He had an accident. So he came back first. Thankfully, he's okay now. He's fully recovered. But he left the bike there because the bike needed some repairs, right? So, but COVID hit. So there was movement control order and then there was circuit breaker. But the husband needed the bike to continue his livelihood. He needed it for his job here. Mm -hmm. So he didn't, she didn't know where to get. They have been asking around and she Google and all that. Um, so, so he wasn't able to work after returning back to Correct. Because correct. he had no because he had no bike. So, so, so he was, he was, she was telling me, uh, can can you help me? Because I don't know where to go for help. And of course, uh, thankfully, with my uh, experience in the public service, I was able to connect her to ICA and to an agency to who can help help her. And actually, the next day, she I met her, her daughter, and she was very happy. And she came to me and said, "Thank you very much because." Uh, we managed to get help from, from ICA. They were very responsive and we are now getting ready for the bike to be back. No, sorry, this, we, I don't want to overpromise on behalf of ICA. <laughs> Open bike, ICA, not the bike back from Malaysia. No, no, the bike is not bad yet. No, the bike is not bad. But they have already, at least they know the procedure. There is an established procedure that ICA help anybody who has these issues to get their property or their uh, things back from, from uh, other countries. Okay, yeah. so it may take some time, it may take some but, time. but at least they have some uh, confidence that yes I, correct so from the daughter's expression i know that she was very happy that uh, uh, we could help her and the family and of course uh, there is hope that her father can go back to work mm. i think that's important right because that's what he needs for her life for his life okay and and how did you meet the the, the family uh to, to find out about this problem it was during our walkabout near the market we were just coming out from the, the market they, yeah. they, came, out they just came out to speak to us okay. So that's very important. And, and and did they were they aware of other people who had similar problems before? They never heard have they ever heard of someone So the daughter it? when speaking to ICA realized that there were quite a number of people with the same issues. So that's why the experience is there. The procedure is already there. But they just didn't know that the agency responsible who can help them is, is, is always available. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's that's very useful to know. Yeah. That's very useful to know. Well, one thing perhaps, so do you have a did you have a similar or do you do you have some sense then of what it is that you want to champion or get done as a result of the people you've met over the last few days? Yes, most definitely. I think it's not only just the last couple of days. You know, you said it uh, just now. I have been um, in the community for a while. And I have been here since the start of the whole circuit breaker. And because of this, a lot of um, the, the kinds of, uh, of, of, of grants, of incentive and support schemes that we have had all through the four budgets, I was here with the community in Pongo. And um, there was something that happened the other day that I thought was um, uh, made me very touch. As I was doing my walkabout, suddenly this person came up to me and said, oh, you are your one name. Mm. And I was like, yes. And then he said, oh, my name is Mr. Cole. And I was like, oh my goodness. And I remembered him because he was somebody, as I you know, worked with the community, had uh, come and uh, 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 talked to me about applying for grants and he wasn't very sure about the conditions, you know, the, the type of uh, paperwork that he needed to put in. And so I actually helped him through, I think about three different grant applications mm. and he remembered this. And I thought this was something that would be very important for me um, mm. in hopefully when I become an MP, you know, to be able to assist mm. our residents, you know, to assist our people and uh, being able to translate national policies into very localized and personal ways of doing things. What, what was the difficulty that he, that he was having that you, that you unpicked from? I, I think sometimes it's kind of difficult to understand 
uh, what you know kind of people work you need to put in. It's kind of difficult sometimes to to write out your story, and all all it takes is for somebody to journey, to walk the journey with you, to hold your hand through the whole process, and it actually takes a uh, yeah. It's it's about understanding what the residents need. Yeah, and, and finding a job particularly is one of those things where you, you perhaps for some people you, you don't do it every day. You know? yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's something that you perhaps did at that particular stage of your life and then the, to, to, to rethink how to do it for a very different type of job in a very different type of environment can be very challenging for some of our yes. Yes. So yeah. can I just can I just use that as a as a way of uh, answering one of our Facebook comments? Mm. Uh, uh, Ang Seng Yong had asked a question. Right? The, really about when we talk about jobs, when, when we, when the comment is about the government talking about jobs, but mm -hmm. actually it's about the, us as a party talking about jobs. Um, uh, Aung San Yong has asked that the, said that the minimum requirement is a degree uh, and that there are gray areas. So first point, the minimum requirement is not a degree. The jobs that we have been talking about before we've had this COVID-19 crisis for some time uh, are not all degree qualification jobs. And in fact, we have emphasize for some time that the foundation should be skilled. Uh, that's why we have the Skills Future Program. That's why we're talking about uh, helping people in the middle of their life, in the middle of their career, transiting from one job to the other. We're not asking them to go and get another degree. No, not at all. We're asking them to have some technical training or some skills proficiency and, and use that or the skills that they've acquired in employment. So I just want to Tell you firstly, it's not about the degree, it's about skills and experience and proficiency. And we'll continue to take that approach, uh, even as we help people transit jobs in the way that uh, Ms. Yeo Wenli talked about in this, uh, in this crisis uh, situation following up on COVID 19. Cheryl, you had a story as well. And maybe I want to add on to that so as we talk about it's about the skills and the skills that you've developed uh, in the course of your career and how you feel that those skills are important to you. Uh, I met uh, this one individual. Uh, he was working in the aerospace industry, and as you, as everyone knows, aerospace industry is one of the toughest industries to be in at the moment. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of our residents in Pasares Pongo, because of proximity to the airport, uh, we have a lot of our residents doing aerospace, airlines, and transportation industry. So, for this one particular resident, uh, he was retrenched as a uh, aircraft technician role or rather aerospace technician role, uh, but he really uh, enjoyed the work that he did uh, and he treasured the skills that he has uh, learned from the years, from his career. But because of COVID-19 and because of the downturn, uh, he had to take on a temporary job for the time being. So he took on the role of uh, doing delivery, uh, but he was certain that he wanted to come back into the industry or in, uh, at least be able to use uh, the skills that he's learned so far. So I think when he was sharing his story, uh, he was quite uh, worried that uh, he wasn't able to use his skill set. Uh, and he was quite worried that he will lose his uh, skills that he's acquired. And he was worried that he would be uh, pigeonholed in a job that uh, is not leveraging on the skills that he has already acquired. So I think one of the things that uh, really sparked off our discussion was that uh, there were also guys at the MRT uh, that were sharing on uh, the WSG initiatives. Mm -hmm. Right. So they had these, huge flags these, at the These back. were our WSG yeah. uh, So these were our WSG ambassadors. And, uh, put him aside and then put one of the ambassadors and say, this is the this is one of the solutions that we can go for. So those WGS ambassadors were working quite hard. They yes, yes. were there as often as we were. Yes. They are there for four weeks. Uh, and they're only off days on Thursday. Uh, so and, and they're really passionate when they were sharing on what were the schemes that's available, whether it was the professional conversion program or whether it was the SG United trainership program. Uh, and, and they were really sharing with that individual, these were the programs that's, that's available. They're still at the MRT, I think they're, they're doing it until about 9 p.m. Uh, maybe that, uh, I bet they were the office center too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think uh, having that opportunity and uh, sharing that story and being able to connect uh, 
that, that individual with uh, the folks from WSG itself, uh, I think that's an important uh, role that we play as a conduit uh, to allow people to develop uh, or to, to get out of these difficult times. So I, I guess my learning lesson from that is uh, many of us are still navigating through this crisis. Uh, we're not out of the woods yet, and there's still a lot of residents that need some help. Uh, it can be quite daunting and quite challenging uh, on what is the help available. And I think it's very important that we uh, take it as our uh, responsibility to be able to share and provide to them, uh, to Desmond's point, the last mile delivery to direct people in the correct direction of uh, getting help, getting the right help uh, to uh, people who need it most. I think that's something that I would truly like to work on. And I'd like to add that actually it's not just help we are giving, you know, because I sense that, you know, when help is available, there is hope. Yes. So we are also providing hope to our residents and their families that through this crisis, you are not alone. We're yes. going to work this together. Yeah, we're going to journey this together. Yeah, we're going to journey together. It's like, like what the one thing has said. Yeah. And I think for me, what has really helped was uh, during the circuit breaker period, uh, myself and uh, Mr. Zainal Safari, uh, we did almost 30, 40... Uh, yes, we had quite a few Zoom sessions. Zoom sessions yeah. on COVID-19, support grants and SIRS. Mm -hmm. And then one of the residents came up to me, you're the SIRS guy. Kind <laughs> <laughs> <I> of, <know>, yeah. <laughs> you, know, uh, you, did, you did on SIRS, you did on uh, uh, internship programs. and yeah. Yeah. internship. In and even did SIRS in Mandarin. Oh, oh wow. yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. We did SIRS in Mandarin. Of course, not by me. You. <laughs> because we have only lasted for two minutes. <laughs> two minutes, <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> uh, we had someone who helped with the translation in Mandarin. Mm. So I think there was also one incident where someone came up to me and said, thank you. Uh, because uh, we went through step-by-step -step details on how do we apply for SIRS. Yes. So I think that uh, that was definitely very uh, fulfilling. And I, I do hope that uh, the right support packages goes to those in need. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Well, it sounds like you guys have got a real sort of deep sense of uh, the kind of things that uh, people are worried about and uh, what it is we need to do to make a, an impact on the lives of our, of our residents if we, if we are elected. I, I'm going to come around and give you a sort of an opportunity for further comments and stories, uh, but maybe SF, yes. do you have any comments about so, this whole set so far? Just, just listening to the stories of our, of our colleagues here, I think this really encapsulates one of the key themes, in fact, the key theme about election is really jobs. Mm -hmm. And I think Singaporeans are concerned. There is anxiety about jobs and uh, what what the changes. What it, it, because this is not just a health crisis, it's an economic crisis. All over the world, unemployment has gone up, supply chains have been disrupted, demand is down. So it is a serious problem about jobs. And it's not just jobs uh, it's because of the slick because of the cycle of the circuit breaker, but it is jobs which are being restructured and changed for the future. Mm -hmm. So we have to deal with jobs from two levels. One level is how do we help people through this immediate period of crisis? It may be several months, it may be a year, a year and a half, but how do we restructure and help people upskill? Companies to restructure, people to upskill, to look forward into the jobs of the future. And I think we can do it. We've mm -hmm. done it before. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Asan. We, we indeed have to commit ourselves to getting this down and uh, put our, our, all our effort into it. Um, before I, I, I maybe take another sort of set of questions uh, from our candidates, I, I'm going to again read out some comments uh, online. Um, and uh, perhaps myself and Asan might have some comments about the comments and uh, some answers, and we can see how we go. <laughs> uh, um, one of the first points uh, is about uh, the Noise, the noise of aircraft in Pumbu. It's a perennial problem. And we do have to apologize to our residents for it. It, it is uh, quite disturbing and it's something that you know it is uh, quite noticeable. We've worked with the higher labor and air base commanders on a regular basis over the years. They have come to engage our residents and our residents even have gone to, to meet them. And actually, many of the pilots also live in our area. The unfortunate reality is that there isn't much that is going to change about the aircraft noise until the air base operations goes elsewhere. 
And the reason is the airspace for these aircraft is quite limited. And uh, while the commanders and the teams have done what they can, any further shift is going to impact either operational capability or the safety of our pilots. And we really can't risk either the security and safety of Singapore and our national defense or the health and lives of the men and women who fly these missions for us. So it's not often that I have to say that this is something that we have to find a way to, to live past and there is no active solution, but I think this is one of those cases. And so all I can really offer is our apologies and we'll continue to find ways to engage with our residents who are facing these types of problems. So I said, I don't know if you want to comment. Well, actually, I mean, I, I, I do know the guys, they come, they, they, they pilot by a base people, and they, as you say, many of them live in Pongo, That's right. close by. And uh, they do understand the issues, and they do take measures to ameliorate the situation. So, you know, to an exam periods, they try and fly a little less. Uh, and uh, there are some periods in which they fly a little more, for example, as they prepare for certain major exercises or major events like the National Day Parade. So they may fly a little more in larger formations in order to prepare for that. So there may be more disruptions for, for residents during those periods of time. But as China says, there is a plan to move out from Pilate mm -hmm. Wire Base uh, into uh, Changi. It requires Changi to be developed, and that will provide us an enormous opportunity too to develop the whole Pilate Wire Base into a new housing, commercial uh, sort of center. Uh, and that again will be jobs quite close to home, actually, for mm -hmm. our residents. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Asa. Indeed, indeed. I'm going to now maybe uh, draw some attention to some comments uh, by uh, a couple of gentlemen, I presume they're gentlemen, uh, Ronnie Gunn and Ken Lai and a few of the others, largely about how we have to do communication better uh, and we have to have a better MPS session and we can't only communicate at our MPS session. We absolutely agree. And that is why communication with our residents occurs through fora like this. And uh, myself and uh, Ms. Yohan Lee had a number of uh, Pongo Town Talks, yes. I know Cheryl, you've done also Zoom webinars. Our email addresses are publicly available. Um, and, and you can contact us sometimes on Facebook, Facebook Messenger. And so the Meet the People session is only one of many, many channels of communication. Ultimately, we will go out there to seek your views uh, and engage with you. Uh, but if you'd like to find ways to do our Meet the People session better, you might be interested to know that they're entirely volunteer run. We have lots of activists and volunteers that help us do this very important work to reach out to our residents. So if you are commenting about the Meet the People session and you have some insight about how to do it better, please come and volunteer and help us do it better. Yes. Uh, yes. And we very much appreciate the, that, you know, you, you could maybe play a part in making this uh, better rather than, you know, uh, merely just pointing it out. Uh, some of the comments are also about, for example, the need for bike patrols. I, uh, wearing a previous hat, very happy if you would like to volunteer to join our active mobility bike patrol to make Pongo and Pasiris a safer uh, place for pedestrians, cyclists, and all forms of active mobility. Um, there's a there's a sharpish comment here, SM, about uh, uh, our party and whether or not uh, we indulge in groupthink. And this is something this has been thrown at us many many times. Um, you know that uh, that uh, whether or not the members of our party have independent minds, uh, and I think you know, we have three great examples here where they have very differing views about all kinds of things, and many of our colleagues, um, incumbents, and in the past have brought very difficult issues to Parliament and engaged in debate. They're quite so. And moved bills and moved legislation that have changed things for residents uh, 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 all across the you might want to comment about that? Well, actually, we do actively go out and look for people with different views. Mm -hmm. And you can see that in the diversity that we have in our MPs. I mean, even in, even in, in the team that we have, the additions that we have, we have someone who has extensive experience as an engineer, worked overseas, works in the private company. We've got one thing who also has extensive experience overseas, bringing investments to Singapore and runs a social enterprise. And we have Desmond, who has a public sector background, but it is a very public sector background. In the SCF, the People's Association, the Crown Base. Mm -hmm. So we do have quite different people. And of course, we have Janet, who is his doctor. And, and, and we do have people who in Parliament who are, you know, who are 
animal rights activists, you know, uh, environmental people who are very interested in environmental issues. Champions for special needs education. Correct. And have made changes and have encouraged government, spoken up, and actually have caused things to change. We've had a number of our members of parliament who have actually championed private members' bills to take through new laws, new legislation to move uh, these issues forward. Christy Souza, uh, several others recently. And so these are reflective of the range of views that we have and how we move uh, the government, the legislation, policy forward. It's not static. We are, we are always moving forward. And that's why we, we, we have to redraft and rethink the manifesto. We have yes. to present our ideas out to the people. And that's part of the electoral process. And ultimately, whether we have made sure that the, the, the policies, the debate, the legislation, the execution has served our people well, then gets decided by the people when they, when they exercise their right to vote. So indeed, we do go out and seek a diversity of views, and we want the diversity of views in Parliament. And that's one of the reasons why we have both the NCFP scheme mm -hmm. as well as the NMP scheme. Mm -hmm. We have both of these so that there is a diversity of views in Parliament. And Parliament is the place where important matters of national interest are debated and discussed. Issues are joined. Good ideas are put forward. Accepted or rejected. And reasons why are examined critically in debate where both sides can join issues. That's what we want. Absolutely. I think uh, I, I completely agree with you, SM, on this. And um, I hope uh, we, we have uh, an opportunity to deliver on exactly that following, uh, following day. Uh, our purpose today was to think through the journey that our mm -hmm. new friends and candidates had gone through. Uh, so thank you for your questions. We'll, we'll try to answer a few more. But I'm going to return back to the central question that we had, which is, you know, starting off as a new candidate, putting yourself forward for election in order to serve the residents as a member of parliament, and then coming through the electoral campaign, you meet people, you engage with issues and ideas, you get tested and you test your ideas, and you have to explain to people and you have to answer to people. That informs then what you want to do as a member of parliament after the election, should you be elected. So I'm going to return back. And I'm going to start with Cheryl this time. Uh, we've had some of the issues around jobs and, uh, and, uh, and reskilling, but that can't be the only thing that people have asked you about, Cheryl. What else have you learned? Yeah. So for me, if I can talk a bit more about the upskilling, because there was something okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> interesting that uh, SM raised just now on the need for re-looking really at how we do things, the new norm of upskilling and doing things differently. Uh, and I'll cite a few examples, or one, one particular example that I found quite interesting. So this was at one of our shopping centers, uh, and uh, we had one of the cleaners uh, operating a uh, cleaning robot. I remember that. That was Loyang Point. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> that, was, that was Loyang Point. So, so I had a conversation with him. Uh, mention the name but uh, we we had an interesting conversation because for me as an engineer i saw the robot was how, how cool it was it was moving around and actually scanning the the <laughs> loyang point itself and it, i did ask him so how, how does the robot move so apparently he has radar sensors and it was mapping out uh loyang point and it also has proximity sensors so it doesn't bang into anyone mm -hmm. so i had a conversation with him and it started with uh, so when when you were told or when uh, he was told that uh, he's going to use this new machine. What, how did he feel about it? So he shared that the first thing he felt about it was he was worried because uh, he thought that automation would take away his job. Mm -hmm. right? uh, in fact, it took him about three months to start learning how to use the machine. Uh, and in the end, after going through the period of training, he was quite happy with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason was because now all he needs to do is to deploy the machine on the floor uh, and then it will make its way through uh, the ground floor itself and then does all the cleaning while he can do other stuff. Mm. So that is upskilling and multi-skilling and at the end of the day, and then I did nothing, so we compensated for it. 
He said, yeah, because uh, I took on this training and he was compensated for it. So I think that is just a small microcosm of uh, some of the improvement and upskilling uh, activities that allow us to multitask. And he had a great deal of pride in his job. He was explaining it to Sharel and myself, mm. yeah. what, what he was doing, how the machine works, etc. It, it was great. Yeah, it was an exciting experience. So, so I think uh, as, as we go through this, uh, the new norm, uh, jobs may be lost or jobs could change. Uh, and there's going to be a great deal of fear in everyone uh, as we move out of the comfort zone. Uh, but I think uh, it's about us coming together uh, and being part of this journey and making sure that we, we, we develop it in a way in which it helps everyone. I mean, we, we, we can't leave anyone behind uh, mm. uh, uh, so that we can come up with and, good, and this better jobs. One of those areas where I know that our unions and our unionists play a big role. Mm. Because I, I, I was an advisor to the UE of electronics unions. And our union leaders and our union chiefs and, and, and those with the budgets, I feel basically, I mean, they come from the workforce themselves. They hold the hands of their fellow workers and say, hey, let's, let's do this. Great yeah. on guys who have done this before, so that they have the confidence to move through this together. Definitely. And just to add on uh, and to help uh, our brother, uh, Mr. Zaina Zafari, uh, lend a voice in this session. Uh, and during this period of training, if you're an NTC union member, you even get an allowance. <laughs> <laughs> $11 for every hour of training. Yeah. Uh, if you're a union member, if you're a non-union member, it's $10. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've... Uh, I persisted you, Mr. Zano, uh, and then you can <laughs> do the next speech on the NPC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but well, I, I think this illustrates that you know there are fears and anxieties mm -hmm. when it comes to jobs, retraining, reskilling, mm -hmm. and there are you know companies have to invest in new equipment mm -hmm. and they have to get a return on that. So there are various parts of this which have to be put together, mm -hmm. and there are various schemes which uh, the different agencies have to package these so that. Companies can be structured, the technology is there, the jobs are created, the training is there, and we can step through this together. Yeah. 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 One thing, what about yourself? You've uh, you, you, you were telling us the story earlier on. Um, has there been issues that you sort of were challenged by then, uh, over and above uh, what you had expected? That now perhaps you want to take forward as lessons, should you be elected as a member of parliament? Yeah, so for me, it's actually really listening to what our residents have to say because I think the whole COVID-19 situation affects people really at the family level, at the personal level. And it's important for us to understand what they're going through. So this um, was a particular incident I remember quite clearly as I was, uh, again, I was uh, walking around one of our community spots, it was a shopping mall in Pongo, and this lady, she, she, she led me to a, to a corner and she said, Malin, could I speak with you on something quite privately because this has affected me quite a bit. Um, and I can see that she was a little bit um, shy about one, one thing to explain the situation. Uh, but uh, essentially in a nutshell, what happens is that she has um, quite a number of children. Uh, she's a single mom and she really needed a very good livelihood, but something in the community because she couldn't leave uh, the Pongo and go to work too far away because she needs to take care of her children. And it got me thinking, hey, this is actually something that we can really dig in and work on. It's actually creating jobs in the community for, for people who need to stay here, for people who are unable to leave um, for, for work outside of, 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 of the community. So I, I think, right, this is something uh, that really taught me a lesson, listen to your residents there will be issues that will be brought up, and it's something that all of us can actually work on for them. Do you think this is, these are issues that we were very um, driven around uh, community mobilization, right? Yes. You, uh, this, was, this was a big thing that yes. you were very interested in. I, I know you spoke very passionately about this uh, yes. at the start of the campaign. Yes. Um, how, over the course of the campaign, what have you learned about this? Is it, are there, do you think, more opportunities? Is this yes. a strategy that's going to work yes, to of course. solve some problems? Of course. Um, I think firstly, um, spirit must be willing and you know, when I speak with the community, I think a lot of people are in it to be part of the SG United solution. So I do think right, this is something that we can really aggregate and get people 
to come and contribute to the community. So I think the spirit is definitely building. And now the thing is execution. How do we do it? And so I, I do think that uh, at the local level, at the, at the Pasiris Pongo level, we'll be able to come up with programs, with campaigns that allow people to do this in a win-win way, both to be able to serve people as well as to create good livelihoods out of this. Mm, excellent. So I'm going to turn to Desmond next. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you were told, telling us about uh, your, how you helped this family uh, get their motorbike back mm -hmm. and then ICA. Mm. Uh, any other issues that you come across, or was there something where you were you were challenged? You, know, you you didn't sort of know exactly how to solve it off the top of your head, or you had some difficulty mm -hmm. helping the residents? Yeah, actually, um, in my last few days of interaction with the residents of Pasu Strongo, there were three segments that kind of I had a lot of opportunities to to get in touch with. One was actually the seniors mm -hmm. in our community. Second is actually the um, sandwich generation right so people of my age group where they have to deal with the uh, jobs and the parents as well as children and the third one is the special needs but i'd like to maybe just uh share a story that i post on my facebook so for those of you who want to find out more you can go to my facebook page uh, which is about seniors and this is a point this is a shameless selling <laughs> sorry yeah. <laughs> just have to say right? please yeah. mine too <laughs> Okay, so so this story is about actually I was at a coffee shop, right? Um, just interacting with the residents, and then I came across these two ladies sitting together mm. having breakfast. So I thought they were friends, so I went to talk to them. Uh, one of them was wheelchair bound, and the other one was uh, they are around about the same age. Right? So I asked, uh, "Oh, are your family or your friends?" Right? That was kind of my my starting question, and. The person which I then shared that actually uh, they're friends, but ever since she had the condition, her friend has decided to stay with her to be her full-time caregiver. Yes. And that kind of like, wow, to me was that um, I, I reflected that this is actually a true example of how friends can become family, right? And, and as I, I was moved by the story, but at the same time, I started thinking about the caregiver because they are around 60s, they're in the 60s. So what happened when she also, you know, needs help at some point? In time, the, right? the lady who was doing giving the care. care. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And that's the part that uh, I don't have the answers, but it's I think it's something that we have to look at, how to look after our seniors in our community, how to ensure that the caregiving is there, and also how to ensure that they their medical need as well as their social need is taken care of in the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But did you have a solution or is this something that you uh, Yeah, it's something that I I have to think think a little bit, maybe with one link's uh, experience well, from the caregiving. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can also share some thoughts in it. Yeah. Actually it does, you know, um I, I think you're absolutely correct. As I went around my block visits, there was something that I actually was keeping an eye out for. It was uh, it was people who are special needs people, adults, mm. who are living with um, their older relatives, parents. Because for me, I do think that this would be an area where we, need, we would need to really look a little bit more into, especially when the special needs parents pass on. These would be people, uh, these would be residents that we will need to take particular care, uh, particular care. And I think, right, perhaps, right, this whole entire idea of, you know, us working together with mm. the elderly language, as well as on this side on special needs um, adults would be something that social mobilization maybe yes, we can explore could, could could i sort of make a comment here mm. uh we met a lot of young people you know, yes. who, some of the first time voters uh, some of them are nearly voters almost voters <laughs> you know, haven't quite got to vote yet you had quite a lot of questions from almost voters as well. yes yes, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so I, I i explained it to them this way i said you can't vote this time for sure you will vote next time. So, you know, think of this like like, like almost your prelim exam. Yes. <laughs> you know, you or ten years season. You just think through, supposing I could vote this time, what were the issues and factors I would take into account uh, in, in deciding how to vote? And then you sort of think through that, follow the issues this time around, follow the issues for the next few years, so that when you get that opportunity to decide uh, and vote or five years' time, then you are much more prepared to vote. Because after all, the future of the country is in your hands when you vote. Mm -hmm. 
You hold that power to decide what that future is. But I was going to come back to this point about um, uh, mobilization and social mobilization. There's a lot of energy and idealism in our groups. Yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, there is a lot of potential to convert that idealism and energy into something practical for the society mm. and the community around us so that we move this from a, from a discussion on, 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 on sort of theory and, and, and sort of how the society should be organized in a theoretical way into a practical way of implementing that in our own community. Mm. I think mm. there's a lot of opportunity for yeah. us. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the one of the things that uh, uh, you know, I, I, I just I want to give my two cents worth because I hadn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we should ask. Yeah, that's right. right. You're doing really traffic lights. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, the, 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 in the campaign, uh, and I remember this in the previous two campaigns that I participated, in, actually was the sheer number of people that are willing to participate and be active yes. around yes. the solution. So I mean, many of them that we interact most closely with, of course, are the activists that that are that are part of our party or come to volunteer to do specific tasks. But actually that spirit amongst the younger, but actually some of them have been doing this for some time as well, volunteers, is very energetic. They're committed to making Singapore. I mean, it's as simple as that. And they're willing to put their heart and soul into it. Yes. And, and you know, Singapore is a large concept, mm. but you just make your community better. Yeah. And that makes a difference. Absolutely. Mm. And then that adds up, adds up, adds up. And then yes. every community then, Okay, I'm, I think we are good. We again have overrun badly. Uh, <laughs> we're now at fifty-two minutes, so we're going to have to uh, sort of start start wrapping up a little bit. Um, I, I, maybe I'll ask for just a few final comments uh, from my from my from my three comrades. I, I'll, I'll go in reverse order. We'll we'll have uh, Desmond first. I think we're the last person I asked. Then we'll have Wan Ling, and then Cheryl, um, and and then we'll have SMT as well. Uh, wrap it up and we'll, we'll see whether we can do this again sometime, but I think we mm -hmm. need to start uh, ending. Mm -hmm. But Desmond, you, you, we've had a wide ranging conversation. If mm -hmm. I think of through what we did last week, what we talked about today, the content ha has touched on every aspect of lives, very personal, very policy, local, uh, in past series, Pungul, and national, um, the immediate crisis in the long term. But uh, I think what I'm most interested in, and I think uh, what would be perhaps uh, uh, most interesting to, to the viewers would be your sense of how this campaign has gone and mm. how it has affected you personally. Mm. Uh, you know, what, what are you taking away as your sort of memory of this campaign? Yeah, so I I would say the word that I would describe my key reflection about this campaign and what we are voting for is unity. Mm. That if there is any time that this nation and our community need to be united. I think this is really the time for us as a community to come together. You know, whether it's helping each other, whether it's um, you know helping our neighbors, you know, friends, our families. I think we have to journey this together as a as a country, as a community, and as a family. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Desmond. That's, uh, absolutely. I think these are values close to our heart. One thing: what's your key takeaway? You know uh, how this campaign has uh, made an impression on you and in your interactions with our residents especially i actually learned a lot from our residents um i think there's a lot of wisdom in the things that they have been sharing with us um there were so many takeaway phrases uh free phrases that i um, heard from them a lot of it was on compassion a lot of it uh, in chinese was yong yong ai xing these were all very, very important learning, live learning lessons for me. And I think this will be something that I'll take myself into my future journey if I get elected uh, as an MP. And also at the same time, for my own personal life as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Um, Sharon, you, uh, you're a pastorist boy standing for election uh, for your own GRC, your own division, right? And so you have... You have a, a personal stake in the future of your home, your family. Uh, how has this left an impression on you? It, may, it must feel a little bit different from you, but what are your key takeaways from this campaign? And I think for me, it has definitely felt very different. 
neighbors now became uh, presidents that you mm. bear some form of responsibility for uh, if given that opportunity. Uh, and then it makes it a lot more uh, real as in how do we get ourselves through these uncharted waters. Mm. Uh, the situation that we're in right now is truly unprecedented. I mean, the impact on the economy, the political situation, the uh, the jobs that are lost, or may be lost, uh, it's really up front and center. And these are truly challenging times. At the end of this election, we have a choice to make for us to come together and to Desmond Point. This election must not divide us, but for us to come stronger together as one unit, as one Singapore, to get us through these tough times. And together, we will make Singapore the best home for our loved ones. That's a heartfelt, uh, heartfelt comment, Shadow. I think we, we all completely agree. I'm, I'm going to hand over to SM Cho in a few minutes just to wrap up this session. Um, we hope to continue this way of engaging with you communicating with our residents for as long as necessary while COVID perhaps causes some restriction in the way we traditionally do things. Um, I'm very touched and moved by the sentiments expressed by our three new candidates, my friends, my comrades. They have gone out there, they have engaged with our residents in Pasiris Pungu GRC, as have I and SMTO, uh, trying to find what are the problems and challenges that we need to address to make sure that you are individually, personally uh, helped and your families by national policies. Uh, they've explained how in doing so, they've grown to understand how giving hope as a result of that personal touch is important and uh, creating opportunities for jobs, for livelihoods, uh, for families to, to, to look after themselves. And again and again, they have expressed that deep commitment to the sense of cohesion and unity that we all hold dear to our heart, um, part of being Singaporean and a value that we in, in PAP also place a lot of emphasis on. So we all look forward to serving you in whatever capacity we can, but we hope to do so as your members of parliament. So for our, our wrap up to this uh, webinar, our, our two rallies, and perhaps a final commentary on our campaign thus far, I'll hand over to SMT. So oh, thank you, John. Well, you've listened to the stories that our candidates have listened to. They've listened to you and they've come through. And my sense is that having worked with them and having gone through this campaign with them, I can see a change in them. It has redoubled their commitment to want to serve you. They now understand much more deeply what it means to be standing for election, to become, hopefully, your member of parliament, if you place your trust in them. And I can see that they understand that much more deeply now through that interaction with you over this very intense period of the campaign. I think all of us understand that this campaign is taking place at a really exceptional time. We had this election at this time in order to clear the deck for us to face very serious crisis in the coming months and years. It's not just a health crisis that's affecting Singapore, it's affecting the whole world. It's not just an economic crisis that's affecting us, it's affecting the whole world. And it's also affecting the geopolitics of the world because where a crisis used to unite countries in the past to find common solutions, the crisis has now become a, a reason for countries to find, to take issue with each other and to divide the world even more. And these things are all going to affect us in the future. And we have to prepare for this uncertainty. This election is really about our lives, our jobs, our future, and indeed, the very future of Singapore. We need a strong, capable government and united people in order to face this future. 
we need to harness all our energies, all our capabilities, all together. To fight the virus, to preserve jobs, to create new jobs for our people, and to come through this crisis together. During this period, we've got to know us better. You know, Janil and I, well, for a number of years, we've got to know my new colleagues. We need your support to take us through it. And we need your votes in order for us to serve you. We ask for your support. We, the PAP, Pasiris, Kovoti, we ask for your support so that we can work together with you. Please vote for us and please vote for the People's Action Party on Friday. Thank you very much.